Hello, and welcome to another very special episode of the Sales Ops Demystified podcast. Today, we're joined by Freya Ma, who is calling in all the way from Sydney, Australia. Freya, Freda, how are you? I'm very well, thank you, Tom. How are you? Pretty, really, really good, thank you. Um, and so this is going to be an interesting chat and because we should be bringing in examples, it answers to the typical questions, but from Freda's previous work and client work right now, because currently I understand you're working with a number of businesses on CRM and sales ops processes. That's right. So I want to kick off by understanding how you initially got exposed to sales operations. When was that and why was that? Okay, uh, a long time ago, I'll be show, showing my age. I might not tell you exactly how long ago. Um, I actually started life as as an IT developer, strangely enough. It was a, a unusual kind of start. Um, all my old IT friends think I came to the dark side when I moved to sales. Uh, and I I really just wanted to make a, a different sort of difference, difference rather than solving technical problems. And I had an opportunity um, – you know, back in the day, I was working in, in PepsiCo and they were a great organisation for developing people and giving them chances across different um, parts of the organisation. And um, an open-minded sales director thought, thought a girl from IT might do, do a good job in, in their set of sales ops team. And, and so I, I moved across and started working on sort of sales process, still from a technology side, but from within the sales team rather than, rather than from an IT perspective. Got it. And so it was someone in sales who saw that you could have a talent further than just the technical side. That's right. And then they brought you over. Okay. And so if we fast forward then all the way to today, I understand you're working with a number of different businesses. Um, What is like the sweet spot for the type of business that you work with at the moment? Um, Look, it's a a client's in a number of different industries. The two sweet spots that are are really um, I'm very close to at the moment are membership associations. So people actually sort of selling and providing services to, you know, um, often professional, like professional memberships. So whether they be engineers or teachers or, or accountants, those kinds of associations. Um, and also in, a, in an area where I spent a long time, which is the sort of healthcare associated areas, whether it's pharmaceuticals, medical devices, or more core kind of healthcare organisations. So, awesome. so in both, both of those spaces. Do you have, when you go into these companies, do you have a typical tech stack that you either like to see or, or recommend? Um, I can't work with people that don't have a cloud CRM. Like that, that really is the core of it because of the work that we do is, you know, broadly supporting lots of different organisations. And if you have to, you know, be on site or be kind of working with, with data that's not easily accessible, um, it's impossible. So, so a core requirement for us is that they have a cloud CRM in play, and um, that that it's usually one of two or three. Um, you know, we work with the big ones, Salesforce, Dynamics, those guys, and there's a, a couple of others that we occasionally work with as well. But, but you know, it's the big players. And is there, I like on top of the CRM, is there any other kind of tools or technologies that you like to see? Um, like I like to see. Some decent BI. Um, it, it always makes a big difference in what we do if they've, they've got something there. But it's surprising how many people are still running really significant parts of their kind of organisation and their analytics on Excel. Um, I, I'd usually like to, I guess, develop clients away from that if I can. <laughs> yeah, of course. And can you share, and this could either be from back at your time at PepsiCo or a, a recent client, something that you guys have done that have significantly boosted productivity of the sales reps? Oh, wow. That's, um, that's a, a big question. It can be answered in so many different ways. Um, probably the one where I've seen people come unstuck in the most significant way is poor territory design. Like, doing a, a sort of a territory restructure or just like tightening up roles and responsibilities as well as the kind of the way that territories are, are approached. Um, I've seen massive, massive differences in productivity, uh, how, especially in organisations where, you know, territories have never really been properly optimised and you end up with one rep that's got thousands of customers, 
customers and is leaving money on the table and another rep, you know, milking the life out of their 10 customers and, and having time left on the table and, and not kind of balancing those things effectively. Um, if, if organisations are really unbalanced in their territory design, then, then fixing that can be the most profound difference in productivity that I've seen. So poor territory design, if you just shared, is it really about communication to the reps, it, like making sure that each rep knows exactly where they should be focusing? Is that the core problem? Um, and sometimes it's in some organisations where they've got really structured territory allocations. Um, if there's sort of, you can, you can only work in this area and then they work in that area, but there's just no potential there. And another rep is working in an area with massive potential and, and not enough time. Um, in some cases, in some cases, it is kind of role clarity as well, and and giving people, as you say, communications and a clear understanding of what they're supposed to be doing. But sometimes it's as simple as which customers are allocated to which representative. Cool. Have you? Oh, well, I, I assume in the, in the last few months that a number of your clients have been working, or the reps of your clients have been working more remotely. Have you? managed or help them manage through that process and do you have anything to share on selling remotely that could help the audience that's a that's another tough tough question and i probably you know selling in my own business i've i've been struggling in in the same way um mastering the technology is a is a good start like really being good at this kind of zoom meeting and being able to you know look at people and understand where you know, where your eyes are, where their eyes are, how you're coming across in this kind of context. It took me a while, I think, to get to start being able to build relationships like in this kind of online space instead of face-to-face over a coffee. Um, so building, building those skills in representatives where they do have the opportunity to connect online with their customers has been really important. Um, and the other one, I think, is just helping them um, – fill their days so even if you know in a lot of the organizations I've worked with um, their representatives have had customers so you know when I was talking before about being in the healthcare space a lot of them have had customers that can't see them won't see them don't have time if they're working in hospitals the reps aren't allowed in hospitals uh, because the hospitals are all closed (laughs) like closed to you know everything other than essential visitors and and so understanding how they can um see what customers they can online, but also set themselves up for when the time comes that they are allowed back in and really be productive with the time that they have in this downtime. Yeah, so one example of a guest that we recently had on, he was instructing sales reps to still call prospects and customers, but instead of to pitch, it would be to share information about if they're in a very specific industry, it would be to share information about the industry, but also ask questions to gather more information. And then they built up this kind of thought leadership from all the reps and then distributed that around people, prospects and customers. So that's an example of something that you're saying here that reps could use to fill their time during these yeah. kind of down periods. Yeah. Yeah. Whether it's, whether it's, you know, intelligence gathering, relationship building, you know, skill building, quite a few clients are, are actually, I thought that this might be a bad time for my kind of work, like the project work and, and development work. And in fact, it's actually been um, a, quite a bonus time really, because there's quite a few people that have gone, no, no, that project we were going to do six months in the future, we're going to do it now because all our reps are, you know, sitting around and it's a perfect time to train them. <laughs> Over the past few weeks, we've spoken to a hundred sales leaders around the world to understand the impact of COVID-19 on revenue. And we've combined these insights into one single report that covers the immediate impact, the commercial outlook, the tech stack that you need, and actionable advice for sales leaders. You can claim this whole report completely for free if you go to ebster.com forward slash COVID. That's ebster.com forward slash COVID. Great. So there's actually a big opportunity now to improve sales processes and to upskill reps when they're not wall-to-wall demos or, or cold calling. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's a, it's a big opportunity to make 
some, some changes, improvements, you know, advance the capability of your sales organization right now. Awesome. Apart from going back to the productivity question, because I feel like you have a wealth of knowledge here, um, apart from territory planning, what else are some of the first things you, you look at and optimize when you would start working with a client? Um, you know, it's funny because that was one of the, the questions I, I knew you'd ask. And I, I was thinking about the thing that I hate the most, which is um, organizations that go, oh, yes, Friday's our admin day. I think you, you're what, like a, a full 20% of your time is sat around talking to each other in the office, not, not talking to customers. Um, and so starting to, uh, there's a certain amount of admin that's, you know, part of life. And, and if you think you're going to do a job with no admin, um, you know, you might be very lucky, but probably not. But putting aside a full 20% of people's time for admin is crazy. So starting to break that down and going, where is that coming from? Is that because your CRM is so awful that you have to spend like the whole of Friday entering in everything from the week past or your forecasting systems and processes are so awful that you have to all be sitting down for a whole day trying to sort that out? Like understanding what's taking people out of the field, taking people away from, you know, FaceTime with their customers um, and starting to, to drill right into that right from the beginning. Yeah, so, it, yeah, the, the problem might not be the fact that they're having the admin day. The problem is why do they need to have the admin day and can we solve that so that yes. we can maybe have an admin 10 minutes every day as opposed to admin day every week? Yes, yeah. And admin, when, you, when you're kind of turning on your car and starting it between, between when you're driving to a customer, not big, giant blocks of time. For sure. Cool. And then moving on with these questions, this one, I, I, I'm not sure how it's going to apply to you, but let's try it anyway. So uh, the, the sales forecasting process, do you have any best practices or any kind of forecasting processes that you like to see or like to implement? Um, funnily enough, there, there's not really one right answer because I work with organizations that are um, generating forecasts from opportunities and so from kind of new deals. Um, that's one kind of structure, but a lot of customers that I have are actually working with an existing client base and doing kind of upsells and cross-sells and, and kind of incremental growth across those client bases. It's a really different forecasting protocol across all of those. Um, in all of those cases, getting the right line between setting um, suitably challenging plans for your sales team and getting a suitably correct forecast for your, you know, delivery ops team, whatever shape that takes in your organisation, um, uh, building that, like managing that tension so that you've got, you know, one number that everyone's bought into is is probably the biggest challenge that I've, you know, I've seen over and over again because the salespeople are always going, but that's too low, you know, we've got to be pushing them harder. And it's like, it's great to push them harder, but you've still got to commit to, somebody delivering something at some time. <laughs> so it's managing the stakeholders, whether it's sales leadership, reps, and also ops and finance to come to yeah. a number that's reasonable. Yeah, yeah, and, and come to a number that you can deliver against. So you've got an ops team scaling up to deliver against this really aggressive forecast, then, then you're going to lose money <laughs> if, that, if that delivery capacity is sitting idle after that. Got it. And then moving on to... Metrics. If you could only choose one sales metric to measure for the rest of your career for, for all of the work that you do, which would you choose? Oh, crikey. Um, oh, no, there is no way I can. There is no way I can choose one because it, it is really, you know, in that kind of um, new business kind of new opportunity space. It's really different metrics from that kind of growth space. Um, in all cases, I would probably say. I would like to avoid for the rest of my life looking in the rear vision mirror only, like and just looking at the result and having that be the metric. Like where, wherever it's possible, I'd love to find the answer of what is the behaviour, like what is the single most important behaviour that this sales team can do that will grow the, grow the top line, grow the revenue that you need and then measure that behaviour consistently so that you know if they're doing that thing, you're going to get that result. 
So if yeah, if if I could only have one answer, it's it's not one metric because that's that's impossible across my client base. But um, it is absolutely to to not look backwards, to look at the thing that's going to deliver your result forward. From one of your clients, when you have done the activity of trying to find that behaviour, what have you found is that behaviour that's most predictive of future sales? Um, often it's um, kind of um, call metrics and not but not really kind of blunt instrument call metrics, but actually just turning up in the right places the right number of times. So, so it's, you know, and there are obviously those three elements to that. It's the, the number of times that you've turned up, but it's also going what's the right place and what's the right time. Like making sure that people are uh, – and, uh, and it's interesting that my first sales boss in Pepsi used to say 80% of success is turning up. And, and it's surprising how many people don't turn up, like how many reps are given leads that they then don't action, how many reps are, um, have opportunities that they fail to follow through. Like, and, it, it's, and people that kind of walk away at the first no – all of those kinds of behaviours are the ones that leave business on the table, are the ones that don't drive success. Awesome. And then finally, who has been the one person who has inspired or educated you the most? Oh, ton, tons of people, but, but probably the first um, like really important sales ops person in my life was, was a lady called Pauline Bernard, who who was a uh, in a pharma um, sales ops sales effectiveness leader, and and pharmaceuticals is such an interesting space from a sales ops perspective because of of all the places, all the things that you can measure, they don't really have on a rep basis a rear vision mirror, like they don't ever know what a rep sold um, in most markets because you don't know which doctors prescribed. All you can ever see is total drug sales. And so if you're talking to doctors about their prescribing, your link between total sales and rep behaviour is really um, assumed. And so to, to understand that, like she taught me how to understand that and taught me how to um, communicate the links that we could find between those things because it's – Think what you're talking about before. The communication in these kinds of roles is so important. Like if you can't help people understand what you're seeing in the data, what you're getting out of the reports, what you're trying to get people to do by putting data into the CRM and the kinds of things that you'll get out, if you can't help people understand that and see those links, you will never get anything done. Yeah, I mean that sounds really ta- really challenging. Being able to try trying to increase sales when you don't have any data on what your reps or the doctors are actually selling. So yeah, that sounds pretty like a, it was a massive challenge. Um, Freda, here's what I liked. Um, we, we pick out a quote from each episode, and I really like the quote. Eighty percent of success is just turning up, but it's surprising how many people don't actually turn up. I think that's a really good quote we're going to be using. Um, your the, the whole admin day thing, but again, not the fact that people are doing so much admin. It's why do they have to do all this admin? It's kind of the role of sales ops to try and be there to, over the long term, reduce the admin so we can inc- increase time spent selling, which is another popular metric from this show. And then finally, your, your part on the metrics and how we don't want to be looking back with all the time and we want to try and find that one behavior that is most predictive and therefore we can optimize for that and then grow sales that way. Um, Freda, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for having me. It's been fun.